He's right here. Well, good morning. As you guys are coming in, let me say good morning to you all. Uh, glad that you're able to come here this morning and worship with us. Uh, let me uh, read from Psalm 24 as we begin our time together of worship this morning. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it on the, upon the rivers. Who shall descend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And it is Jesus that we're here to worship this morning. And so let me just offer a word of prayer for us, and then we'll stand and begin to worship. Father, we thank you for a time of worship. God, we thank you for an opportunity we have to come. God, and, and, and to set aside this allotted time in our week, to fellowship together and to lift high one single name, the name of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for our salvation. God, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. And I pray this morning as we come to worship, God, that you would encourage us. God, that you would increase our passion and our devotion to you. God, that we would receive your grace and your mercy afresh this morning. Lord, that we would know that you are on your throne and you have great compassion for us here. God, I pray that as we worship you, Lord, we will do so in spirit and in truth. Lord, that we, will, that we will magnify your name in this place together. So we ask that you bless our time and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Freedom! Good morning. Thanks, TJ. <laughs> Uh, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand and worship together. Love is well, I was buried beneath my shame. Till I met you well, I was breathing But not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You call my name Come on And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious name Church, now your mercy is saved. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is 
pray. God, you are the only one who can save us. You are the only one worthy of our praise. Let us lift you high, God, and let us hear your word. Let it change us to the very core, God. Let us hear what you have to say to us. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, good morning. I'm glad to see you all this morning. Let me invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to a little book in the New Testament called 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. We're, we're beginning a brand new series this morning, and I hope that uh, you, guys, you guys found our time in the book of Revelation for those several weeks helpful. I hope you found them encouraging, challenging. And this morning we're starting a new series in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Now let me ask you a question. If you were to think in life of all the things that you really dislike, I'm sure that you could have quite a list of things you can come up with. Of all the things that you could think of that you, I won't say hate because hate is a very strong word, but if I was to say something you really dislike, Obviously, things like paying bills, right? Have, if, you have, if you get a flat tire, things you really dislike. I think we all could agree that waiting is something we all really dislike. The estimates about waiting, the average time that the, that the average person in your life, the average time that you spend waiting, the estimates are all over the place. Really, they, on a conservative number, you spend six months of your life waiting. 
depending on your job, depending on your lifestyle, depending on what, uh, what, you, what you do, what your hobbies are, you can spend up to five years of your life waiting. In fact, from the time that you began to drive at 15, if you are still driving from 15, some of you drove before that, if you were driving at 15 until you were 65 years old, you would spend, on average, based on the number of miles that people drive a year, you would spend 122 days just sitting at red lights. 122 days just sitting at red lights waiting, right? Waiting. We, it's something that we don't like to do, and yet as Christians, waiting is something that we have to grow comfortable with. It's something that we have to be content with, we have to wrestle with and deal with because here's where we find ourselves. That right now, we find ourselves in, 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 kind of in between two places. We find ourselves here in this world, glad to be alive, living the life that God is giving us right now, and yet we know there is more in store for us than just this life. That there is a dwelling place with God that Jesus has secured for us, that God has promised with us. That we know that there, there is coming a day where we will see the Lord Jesus face to face. That all pain and sorrow will be no more. That every sickness and disease is eradicated. That our joy in the Lord will be maximized the way that God originally designed for us to experience joy. And we live between two worlds. We live in the here and now and we see a world that bears the scars of sin and death. And yet we know that there is a new heavens and a new earth on the way. That Jesus has promised each and every one of us as his people. So we live with that tension that we're grateful here and now. And yet we have a, a, a greater sense of longing for something better to come in the future. That's where we live. We're caught right here in the middle. So, but right now, we're in this period of waiting. 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 What do, we, what do we do while we wait? That's the question. Waiting does not mean you do nothing. I mean, think about when you go to, when, you, when you're on the phone with customer service and you're put on hold and you have to wait. You begin to fidget with things. You begin to look at your phone. You, you don't just sit there and do nothing. You, you're sitting maybe in the emergency room with a sick loved one. And, met, you know, my, my mom loves to bring crossword puzzles everywhere she goes because she can't stand to wait and do nothing. So, so we're, we're in the waiting, we're, we're still called to do something. In fact, our lives in light of eternity matter that your life the 60 70 80 90 years maybe that you're here maybe it's 45 your life right now matters in light of eternity that your life in Jesus Christ has purpose and importance that is why we're looking at the book of first Thessalonians this little five chapter book is a book written to Christians who are so full of joy and so happy about the promises of God that are coming in the future, so happy about Jesus coming back, so happy about eternity with God. They're so looking forward to that, and yet at the same time, they are living their lives like every day could be their last. You see, we live in a pattern of waiting right now. We're waiting for God to make, to, for God to fulfill all of his promises that, 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 that we know that eternity is coming. It's on the way. And right now, we live with purpose. We live with meaning. We live with, we live with importance that God has something for us to do in the waiting. How we live in, in the here and now as we draw nearer and nearer to eternity. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but every day that you're alive... You wake up in the morning and you go to sleep and you wake back up the next day. Every day you are one step closer, one day closer to seeing the Lord. One day closer, one month closer, one year closer, one decade 
closer to seeing Jesus. And that how we spend our lives here, how we display the power of God in our lives matters. That is what this little series that we're beginning this morning, 1 Thessalonians, is all about. Let me invite you to stand with me, and and I'm going to read the the 10 verses of chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for, you, for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you have received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait from his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning, God, and we're grateful that you have appointed each and every one of us to be here this morning. God, that, that you knew that on, on your radar, that, that as you designed and created this day, that this would be a day of worship and a day of lifting up Jesus. God, we're thankful for each and every person here this morning. God, we're, more importantly, we're thankful that you're here this morning. God, that we can call on you. God, and you are near and you care. So this morning I ask as we look at your word, God, that you would speak to us through it. God, that you would challenge us. Lord, you would convict us. Lord, you would encourage us and you'd build our faith in Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in his name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so we get here to 1 Thessalonians. And we're in, like I said, this this little book is is five chapters. And we we get to the first chapter and we have a, we see the big picture, something that, that, that Paul wants us to know about as we're living now in in the present here in 2020 as we're living in light of the fact that Jesus is one day we don't know when he's going to return he's going to come again that eternity is drawing near Paul wants us to understand the first thing in his letter is this while we wait be thankful that there is something about living with an attitude of thankfulness that is powerful, that is transformative. There's something about the posture of gratitude that I can wake up every day and I can come before the Lord and I can be grateful for, all, for, for the fact that I belong to him, for the fact that I am saved, for the fact that I am forgiven forever, that I can wake up and there, there, are, there, are a, there is a list of things that I could spend a thousand years thanking the Lord for that every day that here and now in the waiting as believers in Jesus we need to adopt a posture of thankfulness so much to be thankful for so while we wait as we're drawing nearer to heaven as we're drawing nearer to eternity be thankful church so let me give you some context here as, before we dive into the letter. Let me tell you a little bit of, just for a moment about 
the Thessalonians and how the church got its start because it's going to be it's going to help us understand why Paul is saying what he's saying here. Thessalonica is a place in it was the capital of Macedonia in northern Greece. It was it was a it was it was a proud city, it was a free city, it was a prosperous city. There was all kinds of worship. There were worship of Roman gods and Greek gods and I mean this place was that was the happening place in Macedonia. In fact, it was so hap it was so happening, it was so important that Paul, the apostle Paul, as he travels the known world on three different mission trips, as he's going throughout the world, he makes, the Lord directs him, and he makes a point to stop in Thessalonica, this little city. And if you were to go back in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, and you were to look at that, you would see how, this, how the church got its start there, and it's going to be so important here. So let me just sum it up. We don't have time to read it, but let me sum it up for you. In Acts 17, Paul is there, his missionary team comes into Thessalonica, and the book of Acts is written by a man named Luke. He's a doctor, he's a physician, he loves facts. Luke is the same guy who wrote the gospel of Luke. He, he, he did all the research, he wrote a biography about Jesus, and then he writes the book of Acts. The book of Acts is how the church began and how it grew and how the message of Jesus went out into the, into the whole known world. Well, here... Luke tells us that Paul and his team went to Thessalonica. And they were there, forget this, they were there for three Saturdays. For three weeks. That's all they were there for. They didn't spend two years there. They didn't, they didn't spend a decade there. They spent three weeks in this little city or in this big city. And Paul is there in the synagogue and he's teaching these people about Jesus. And he's saying, listen, Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise God's ever made. That, G they, that every promise God's ever made in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. That Jesus is the true king. Jesus is the true Messiah. Jesus is the one that, that, that has been promised to come and to save us from our sins. And by the way, in the book of Acts, that Christians were known around the world as being the very people who turned the world upside down with the message of Jesus. So that's, that's, if you can go back and read Acts 17, and you'll see that early on in the chapter. And so people are coming to faith in Jesus. Things are happening. The church is growing. People are saying, I'm not going to pledge allegiance to Caesar, but I'm pledging allegiance to another king, and his name is Jesus. And so what happens is, is people, they don't like that, right? Like you only can talk about Jesus so much around some people before they become either offended or annoyed. Well, here in Acts 17, as this church right here is, is being started, as people are coming to faith in Jesus, a mob forms. Now, a mob, it, this mob was violent, it was angry, it was aggressive, and they wanted two men to be brought to them. They actually went knocking on the doors of known Christians to find Paul and Silas. Why? Probably to beat them, possibly to kill them. Okay, this was, this was a big deal. In fact, they had to be snuck out of the city during the nighttime. Right? It was not safe for Paul and Silas anymore in Thessalonica. So Paul has three weeks with these, with these brand new Christians. These people who say, you know what? We believe in Jesus. We want to be forgiven of our sin. We, 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 we've heard the stories about him dying on a cross and, and that the tomb is empty. And, I mean, they are, they are saying, we're in. We're, we believe. We want, we want to follow this Jesus. Paul was there three weeks, and he's run out of the city. And here they are, spiritual babies. If you were to say, Dustin, Freedom Fellowship, everybody here is a brand new believer They've been a believer for, everybody's been a believer for three weeks. You've got three weeks to teach them everything they need to know. It'd be impossible. It'd be impossible. Either that or we'd have some really long services, right? I mean, it'd be impossible. It couldn't happen, right? I mean, you, you, you would take, it, would take, it takes a lifetime to, 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 to dig into the Word of God. And so, so, so Paul has three weeks and he's gone. He can't disciple them. He can't stay and talk to them. He got run out of the city, what does he do? He writes two letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and that's where we pick up here this morning. This was written within, within, within less than two decades, less than 20 years from the death and resurrection of Jesus. I, 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 you, 20 years is nothing in terms of historical 
records. I, I was on staff at a church once, and there was a guy in the hospital. He was another staff member, and he was in his 80s. He was 84 years old, and, I was, and, he, and, we, and he had fallen and broken a hip, and he was, he was 12 weeks in a rehab facility. And I just showed up every Sunday. Every Sunday, I went to, go, I went to that rehab facility for 12 weeks, and I just spent an hour with him talking to him, listening to his stories. And I said, hey, I said, uh, what's like, what's something you remember from your childhood? Like, I, when I, was, I was a kid when 9-11 happened. I was in sixth grade. I was 11 years old. So I was like, man, I remember when 9-11 happened. I remember the, the principal coming in. I remember the teacher turning the, the television on. I mean, I remember all this stuff, right? I said, what, what do you have like that? And he goes, I remember when they bombed Pearl Harbor. I was like, are you serious? I was like, you were, you were, I said, how old? He said, I was seven. I said, you remember when they bombed Pearl Harbor? I said, that was, I mean, how long ago was that? You know, I mean, that's, that's, that, it, decades ago. What, 60 years? I mean, it was, it was insane. I said, you remember that? He said, just like it was yesterday. Within 20 years, not a long time, Jesus was crucified and resurrected from this time this is written. Not 20 years is nothing. And these people are going, wait a second. You're telling us about Jesus? Yeah, we've heard of Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. And so here they are. They are, they are coming to faith in Jesus, and they want to know more. Here's the great theme, and I put this in your notes if you have them this morning. Here is the great main theme that we're going to talk about over the next several weeks in 1 Thessalonians. It's this. That we are called to walk in holiness as we wait for the return of Jesus. That's the whole point of the whole book. And he's going to tell us how we can do it. How do we live in light of Jesus coming again? How is it? What do, we, what do our lives look like? like? Like we have a great big hope that we know that God is sovereign, that he is king. We know that, that he is coming again like he promised he would. How do we wait for him? What do we do? We walk in holiness as we wait. Now, that word holiness is people have misused and abused the word holiness. The word holy just means to be different. That I'm different than the world because God has made me different. That I'm to live differently. I'm to be differently. I'm to think differently because Jesus has changed out my life. So this little letter here is a short letter, five chapters. If you, if you sat down and read it, it'd take you... 10, 15 minutes. I mean, it wouldn't take you very long, hardly at all, to read this entire letter. And it, every child, I love this, every chapter ends with an emphasis on the fact that Jesus is coming again. I love that. Because I think sometimes we need to be reminded that we can be so nearsighted, we can become so short-sighted, that we, we fall into the tendency to, to believe that this life is all that there is. Oh, man, I'm going to live 80, Lord willing, I'll live 80 years on earth, pff, gone. No, there is more, Right? I mean, this is, not, this is not the end of the road that, that we, we, we become so short-sighted that, we need, that Paul reminds them at the end of every chapter, hey, church, listen, the reason your lives matter is because Jesus is coming again for his people. He's looking for you. He's coming. He's on the, there is a day on God's divine calendar where Jesus will come again. What a great hope. So with that context, let's go. Verse 1, let's read. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, Silvanus being another, word for, being another uh, form of Silas, like Chris, Christopher, I mean, you know, you could, you could parse that out, Silvanus, Silas. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. So here Paul and his little protege, his young apprentice Timothy, and his, and his traveling companion, Silas, are greeting the church. And look at this. I love this. Very, 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 very powerful. Grace to you and peace. That is an explosive powder keg of a phrase. Grace to you and peace. Grace being the unmerited favor of God that I don't deserve anything from him. And yet God is so compassionate and merciful. That he, that he makes us his own. Peace, the nature of our relationship with God, the nature of our relationship with one another in Christ, and our, the nature of how we can deal in with life's various circumstances that we can have real and lasting peace. 
And we have it with God because Jesus bridged the divide with God. That's amazing. Grace to you and peace. You, can't, you won't find grace and peace in the world. That there is a kind of divine, heavenly grace and peace that only comes from Jesus. Unmerited, undeserved love and compassion. Peace that surpasses all understanding belongs to you, church, in Jesus Christ. So right off here we get, we get this, we, we see this is a letter of compassion. That Paul is moved with compassion. He wants us to think rightly about some key things about the second coming of Jesus. And, and, and we, th- we do think about it sometimes, right? Like when we think about the second coming of Jesus, usually it happens in two forms. Usually we're, we're watching the news, we see a tragedy, and we go, oh, Jesus, please come quickly. Or we have a personal situation, and maybe spouse has cancer, a child dies, And we go, Lord Jesus, will you please come quickly? I can't take much more of this. That is usually what we think about. That's usually where our thinking about the second coming comes in, and that is good. And Paul wants us to, he wants us to see, he wants us to long for, to be hungry for, to say, God, this world is so jacked up. Would you please come and and, and, and reunite with us? That's, that is, that is good. And also, Paul wants to see that as we're patiently waiting for that, how we can live. So how do we start? That every day of our lives, Paul wants us to see God's fingerprints of grace in our lives, grace and peace. Well, how do, how, what is the first thing that Paul gets at here? It's thanksgiving. Look at verse 2. We start with thanksgiving. Start with thanksgiving. Our lives as Christians need to be marked by an attitude of gratitude. That helps you remember it. We need, we, our lives, we ought to be the most thankful people in the world. That that is the tendency we have to grumble is natural. The tendency we have to complain and be pessimistic for some people, that is natural. But at the very least, when we, ref- when we, when we slow down in life, because we're so busy, when we slow down in life and we, we remember who Jesus is and what he has done for us, what he is doing for us, and what he's coming again to do for us, when we slow down and remember those things, it ought to create and cultivate an attitude of thanksgiving in our lives. We ought to be thankful every day. Look at, look at verse 2. He starts with a prayer here. By the way, there are three in this little letter, which is interesting. Three prayers. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Look at verse 2. We give thanks to God always. I love that. Always. Always give thanks. Always giving thanks for all of you. Constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Now, we pray all kinds of prayers, right? We pray all kinds of prayers, right? And we, pray, we pray prayers uh, for our needs, like, for example, uh, we need, we're sick or we're broke or we have an emotional or mental breakdown or issue or anxiety, those things are fine. God, God, God invites us. He wants us to pray those type of prayers. Sometimes we pray prayers of confession. I'll be doing that daily, and that's good. Lord, I, here I am. Lord, you know I've messed up. Lord, I want to walk with you. I, I just, I, I'm struggling. That's okay. Prayers of confession. That's good, but some of our prayers, some of our attitude toward in our relationship with God, our attitude towards God ought to be an honest thankfulness for just for who he is. I wake up and I go, Lord, like, God, you, God, you are, you are good and faithful and sovereign and holy and compassionate and merciful and gracious and forgiving that, that you that you have that you are that you have a plan for me and that you're that that you're working powerfully in my life like we have all these things we could be thankful for paul says listen i'm starting my letter with prayer that's a little example that's a little that's a little that's a little um, illustration of how our lives ought to be lived that we uh, every day we should start our lives with a posture of gratitude to the God of the universe, that, thank, that thankfulness to God is the right way to daily live. I mean, that everything I have, I can trace back to the good hand of God. 
that, there, that, 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 that I have nothing apart from God. I have nothing apart from the grace of Jesus. Thanksgiving, to, to give thanks is to give honor and praise, and there is but one person who's worthy of our honor and our praise, and that's the Lord. His abundant goodness, His abundant mercy in our lives. But what is Paul like? I, to, in order to show us how thankful we ought to be, Paul, he, he tells us some things we ought to be thankful for. What are some of those things? What should we be regularly thanking God for as we, as we wait uh, as we wait for Jesus to come. The first thing, verse 2 to 5, is this. Evidence of God's grace in our lives. Paul here is talking about, first thing he talks about is evidences of God's grace in our lives. Look with me at verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. These starting verses right here are startling verses. You know why? Because they tell us that you have visible expressions. You have real-time proof that you belong to God. That as you live your life, you will bear fruit and people can see and you can, you can look back. Hindsight's twenty twenty. You can look back and you can see how God is working in your life. You know, that is one of the biggest questions that I've probably gotten in, in my eight years of teaching the Bible. Is I, I, how do I know that I'm really saved? Because we don't believe you can lose your salvation. The Bible te doesn't teach that. Jesus says that, that, that whoever the Father gives to me is, is secure in my hand, John 10. So, we're not, so we're not, that's not what we're talking about. But how do I know that I'm saved to begin with? Like, like I'm struggling with sin. I've got all these doubts in my mind. I'm wrestling in my mind. All, I want to believe, but then I don't know if I believe. And we always we, we, we wrestle with assurance sometimes. Some of us don't. Some of us are full of 100% confidence, and that's okay. But some, the rest of us sometimes struggle. We wake up in the morning and it's, 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 it, you're having a Monday, right? I mean, it's, it's hard. And you're wondering, God, what, like, are, are we not on the same page? Like, what's happening? People wrestle with, how do I know if I'm truly saved? And here's the thing. If we belong to Jesus, God will be at work in our lives. There will be evidences of, we, we will be able to see the grace of God in our life. Paul is thanking God their faith is real, right? We don't, want, we don't want just information in our brains. We can get all kinds of, you can get TED Talks, podcasts, books. I mean, you can go to lectures. You can get, you can get information until you're, until, until you're sick of it. It's un, it we're, we, are, we are overloaded with information. But Paul says that faith in Jesus is something, it's a reality in your life. It really changes you. You can see it in action. That if we belong to Jesus, we will see the grace of God in our lives. And there are all kinds of assurances we can have. But here's what Paul gives us. Number one, here in the text, your work of faith. So Paul is not talking about good deeds that you, that, you, that you need to do to earn forgiveness from God because we know that salvation, that our redemption is totally by the grace of God because Jesus died on a cross and rose again from the grave for us. But rather, what he's saying is this. Faith works. That real faith in Jesus actually makes a difference in your life. That the work of faith, that there is an overflow of your relationship with Jesus. There is, there is fruit, that your, that your faith is alive. That you don't just say, I believe in Jesus, and then totally, for however long God gives you to live, totally unchanged. But rather, because we are believing that God is, because we are believing, we are trusting, God works and he chisels away, and he makes us into the people that he wants us to be. That faith is active. Faith does something. It's a rare kind of energy that, that powerfully pushes you and propels you to live differently. To show hospitality towards a stranger. To serve the poor. 
to forgive somebody who's wronged you, including your enemy. To, to, to comfort a grieving friend or family member. To, per, to meet and provide a need to somebody you know. That faith in Jesus produces real fruit. The second thing here is that he says that I can see your labor of love. Love. You know, before we came to Jesus, our life pre-Jesus, our motivations were simple. That if it looks good, get it. If it feels good, do it. That, 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 is, that is the operating system within our hearts. Feels good, going to do that. Looks good, I'm going to take that. Like, that's us before Jesus. And so, but what God does is he changes our hearts. He, his grace works within us over a lifetime. And our motivation becomes simple. And here, here's what it is. Love. Love God and love one another. Not, over, not easy, but not overly complicated. Love God and love one another. That our lives in Jesus are the byproducts of the choices that we make that are motivated by, the, by love. Love is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Authentic Christian living is marked by love. It's marked by love. And you know what Paul tells us about love right here? Love is a labor. It's hard work. That love is the hardest kind of work. It's easy to kind of like somebody and keep moving on. It's a lot harder to actually intentionally love somebody, whether you, can, whether you agree with them or not. That Ravi Zacharias said this, Love is hard work. It's the hardest work I know of. Work from which you are never entitled to take a vacation. So here's the deal, church. That as we're walking with Jesus, that God, what he, God does he, is he stretches our capacity to love him and love other people. That I, as, I, as the, the more that I walk with him, the more patient, the more sacrificial, the more respectful, the more honoring I become towards other people. And that, mean, that includes people, whether that's a friend, whether that's a neighbor, or whether that's an enemy, that whether they disagree and hate me, or whether they are best friend, love me, part of the family. Doesn't matter. We are, that, that, that love is hard work. But by the grace and strength of God, we can do it. That we can, we can love the way that Jesus loves us. In his power, in his strength. And the third evidence of grace in our lives is this. It produces an enduring hope, steadfastness of hope. That as God is at work within us, God produces a, a, a very unique and, 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 and strange characteristic, hope that endures. Turn, read a newspaper. How much hope do you find there? Get on Facebook. How much hope do you find it on Facebook? Turn on your television or listen to talk radio. How much hope you find in there? That ho uh, lasting, real hope is something that only comes from Jesus. It transcends every circumstance in life. It transcends death itself. That there is a kind of enduring hope that we can have in the Lord. That here these Christians are facing persecution, they're facing pressure, they are brand new to Jesus, and they're saying, you know what, I'm, we're keeping on keeping on. There is a kind of hope that we have. We can keep on loving, we can keep on serving people. Why? Because we know that God in heaven is for us, he is with us. That hope is not a flimsy wish. You know, you, you, you go to the mall and you, you pull out a penny and, and you flip it into a fountain and you make a wish. Oh, Lord, I love that new Camaro. And if I could just, you know. You do, we do that. Kind of, oh, oh, I love to buy, be able to buy, flip, what a, a new iPad, whatever. You flip it in there, right? It's a, a, that's a flimsy wish. Hope is a deep-rooted confidence that God's word is true and Jesus is who he said he is. It's knowing that, you know what, that, that because of the cross and resurrection, we know we can, we can live our lives on every word that God has said. We can trust him. 
we can, we can have hope that a better, you, you, right now you in your life, right now you may be in the, in the most difficult situation you've ever been in. You may be furloughed from a job. You may be in a situation where your loved ones are deathly sick. You may be facing some challenges you've never faced before. And yet at the same time, you can have a great big hope that God is faithful to fulfill every promise, and that means he's coming back for you. That faith, love, and hope in your life are evidences that you belong to Jesus. Look at verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, life-changing power. Not just in things we believe mentally, but power in our lives. And in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Here's the reason why faith, love, and hope are such a big deal. Here's what it tells us about ourselves. That God knew you before you were born, and he said, I want you are loved by God. And out of that great love, God chose you and said, you know what? I want you. I knew you would, I knew you'd be weak. I knew you would fall short. I knew you would struggle. I know that you'll sin. I know that you that apart from me you have nothing. But I know that, that you can't I know that you can't offer me anything. And yet God says, I love you anyway. I want you. He wants you. While we were unworthy, he wants you. He wants me. He wants us. It is his good pleasure to love you. Wow. How thankful should we be every day to wake up knowing God said, hey, hey, Dustin, I love you and I want you. And, and how you'll know that you belong to me is that you'll be growing over a lifetime in faith, love, and hope evidence of God's grace in our lives. Should we, should we be thankful? Absolutely. Absolutely. The second thing we're thankful for in verses 6 to 8 is a joyful witness. Joy. I love, I love the word joy. I think, I, think the, I think joy is a power. Is, I think outside of love, joy is the most powerful emotion. I think, it's the, I think that joy in the Lord is, is, is one of the greatest things we can experience we, can ha we, can, we are thankful for a joyful witness. Look at verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you have received the word in much affliction with the joy, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So Paul carries on here in his opening part of the letter, and he says, listen, you can be thankful. For the I'm thankful for the fact that you're joyful, that you have joy. That, that the church of Thessalonica, they're following the example of Paul, and they're choosing faithfulness over comfort. They're saying, listen, Paul, we know that you preached Jesus for three weeks, and they ran you out of town, but we're in anyway. We want to follow Jesus too. And what's happening is, is God's created within them a spirit of joy. Hey, it doesn't matter if they oppose us. The government may try to run us out of town. There may be a mob that comes after us and, and, knocks, and, and tries to beat down the door of my house. That's okay because I know that there is a kind of transcendent joy and hope in Jesus. That they say, yeah, we're, we're in. That they, that, they, that they knew that following Jesus would mean opposition and, they, and affliction. And they received it with joy. Did you know this morning that you can face immense suffering with joy? That you, can, that you can fight the battles of life. Well, God will actually fight your battles for you. But you can fight, the, the, you can be in the battle for, uh, of, of, of your lifetime. And you can face whatever that thing is with joy. Joy is a gift of the Holy Spirit that he gives to his people. As we lean into Jesus, as we, as we trust him in times of trial and tribulation, you will find joy and satisfaction. God will increase it and grow it within your heart. Their faith in Jesus was so publicly joyful. Look at verse 7. You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia. I mean, if I had a map, huge place. And Achaia, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, already a big, big place. That's like saying, not only has the word sounded forth from you in the Lakeway area and in East Tennessee, or in the state of Tennessee, 
But your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. That these people, young in the faith, have chosen to be faithful. That their testimony has, has not just stopped in East Tennessee or not just stopped in the, in the state of Tennessee, but that their faith in Jesus is known all across the nation. Known everywhere, it says. Their, their, their example was making an impact everywhere. That they're living like Jesus is coming again and that my life right now matters. And the same joy, the same power, the same witness that the, that the church here in Thessalonica had is the same energy and power and witness and joy that we can have too. That we have the opportunity to turn the Lakeway area upside down with the good news of Jesus Christ. That we can, we can wake up and choose to be thankful. Why? For the joy I have in my heart. That I may not always be happy. I mean, it doesn't take very long to get some people mad. You sit in traffic long enough. Like we are talking about earlier, the waiting thing. You sit in traffic long enough. Happiness is a foregone conclusion. It's out the window. But man, you can be joyful. Hey, nobody can steal your joy. People can take your happiness, right? They can take, somebody comes and sideswaps your mailbox that you just built, you know, or, so, or something like, you know, somebody comes and, and you know, and, 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 and says something to you at work and has ruined your day. Somebody could take away your happiness, but nobody can steal your joy. Nobody can steal your joy. That whether, whether things are going great or whether we're facing intense pressure, man, we can be joyful. Why? God is for us. We belong to Jesus. And the third thing, the last thing here, verses 9 and 10, that Paul wants us to see, hey, listen, you ought to be thankful. Let me give you another reason, Paul says, why you ought to be thankful. This is the most important one, I believe. Verse 9 and 10, we're thankful for a life-giving redeemer. A life-giving redeemer. That Jesus gives us life. Verse 9. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. In other words, hey, we're hearing about your faith. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The, the, these last two verses right here are the most important verses of the, of the, of the entire chapter. They're the most significant. And we say, well, why, why is that? Because verses 9 and 10 tell our story. That verses 9 and 10 describe you and me. That if we were, if we were to say, okay, Paul, why should we be thankful? Paul says, here's your testimony, verse 9 and 10. And, and, and here's what, the reason that we can, the reason we bear fruit, the reason we have faith, love, and hope, the reason that we can have jo a joyful witness, even when, even when we face opposition, is found right here. That, be, that because of verses 9 and 10, people could say, man, you guys are the real deal. You're not knockoffs. You're the real deal. You're authentic. This is our story. By the grace of God, we have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Do you know what it means to be a follower of Jesus? It means to abandon all other idols. No, I want you to look at, I want you to look at the text. By the way, if you're new to Freedom Fellowship, we, we take, we look at the Bible, okay? I can give you my, we look at the text, what God has said, right? So I want you to look at the text here. Verse 9 and 10, look, at, look here, look at real, real clearly right here. Look at how God is described here. As, as, as opposite of an idol. God is living and true. So, what it, so contrasting that, what must idols be? Dead and false. Dead and false. Idols are dead and false substitutes. That any, any, an idol can be anything. A person, comfort, sports, money, stuff, uh, other lowercase g gods. Idols can even be good things that we give a terrible promotion to and we make them the ultimate thing in our lives. That when, that when we give something first priority in our life, 
so that it dictates how we spend our money, that it dictates our schedule, that it dictates how we think, how we make decisions, the choices that we have. When we put something in that place of first priority, if it's not God, if it's not Jesus, it's an idol. Because that thing in, in the first priority space slot in our lives, that is the thing we likely worship. And they can exist as, yes, as, as physical statues like here in this day. Idols can exist in our hearts. Here's what we need to know. That we, uh, while we all struggle with, 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 with these things, we all struggle with temptation to compromise and, to, and, to begin, and, and things are competing for our worship. And yet idols cannot save. Idols do not provide lasting joy in life. Idols cannot fulfill all the promises they make, but God can. Why? Because the text says, Paul's telling us God is living. He's true. He's real. So this picture of turning from idols one way, turning to Jesus another way, that's a picture of repentance. What is repentance? It means to turn around. That I was walking with, I, I, I was addicted, I was walking towards clinging to sin, going down one way on this highway, I encounter the grace of God, God turns the car around, and now I'm walking with him this way. That is what repentance is. That's what's happening here. We turn from idols and we embrace Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's something we have to do every single day because, yes, salvation is a one-time event that when we come to faith in Jesus, we are saved, we are justified, we are forgiven, but every day there are things competing for our affection. And every day, for my daily obedience, I need to be turning from idols. Money, popularity, comfort, Whatever it may be, turning to Jesus is a daily choice we have to make. And we can be thankful because of the grace of God that God has indeed changed our lives. He gives us life. Look here at the text real quickly. There are two important aspects here of God's transforming power we see in the text. He, he says the word serving and the word waiting, that you turn to serve God the living and true God, while to, and to wait for his son to come, to come from heaven. Serving and waiting. S waiting is not passive. I, I recently did a wedding. I've done a couple weddings this summer. Um, I recently did a wedding. And you know when, a, when as a man, you're waiting for your bride to, to walk through the back doors of the church or to walk out of the, the back doors to come in, maybe like if it's an outdoor setting, there's like barn doors or whatever. Uh, you know, you know there, there's a kind of eager expectation that he's going to get to see his bride. He's going to get to hold her hands. He's going to get to be near her. He's going to get to talk to her. He's going to get to look at her beauty and just, and just, and just kind of be in awe and be thankful for her. Waiting is not a... Waiting is not a passive thing. It's active. It's anticipating something. So we wait now. We're waiting eagerly, expecting Jesus to return. But as we do that, we're serving God. That God's grace is really transformational. That he's working in our lives. He's tearing down infrastructures of sin. And he's, and he's putting in your life love, faith, and hope. He's calling, us to, he's calling us to live. He, he wants us to be alive, to be fully alive. He doesn't want dead, negligent, apathetic, careless Christians. He, he, he is a God who is alive, so we should be alive. Look at verse 10. He's working in our lives now, but he's coming again in the future to wait for his son from heaven, for whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. You know, one of, the core, one of the core main principles, tenets of Christianity is that we believe that Jesus is coming again. He came once before. He's coming again. He, he came first as a, a, a born of a virgin, living a sinless life, dying on a cross for our sins, forgiving us of our sins. God raised him from the dead, and he said, I will return once again. And that he's bringing us salvation. He's bringing us eternal life for all of those who pledge our allegiance to him. That we, we can be truly alive. And that there's a day of reckoning coming on sin and evil. 
that, that Jesus will pour out wrath on sin and sinners who don't trust him. But, but for those of us who trust him, he's our redeemer. He has delivered us. He has delivered us. You are delivered. You are saved. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are chosen. That you, have been, that you are the object of God's affection. And if we can't be thankful for the life-giving realities of the grace of God, what can we be thankful for? That because of Jesus, one day he's coming and he will finally and fully deliver us from this body of sin and death. That there is no condemnation for you. That there is no wrath for you. There is only eternal life and joy in God. Jesus is the kind of redeemer that gives new life. That changes life and for that, for, for him, we give thanks. That thankfulness is an everyday attitude of God's people. So here as we stand in these next few moments and as we sing and as, we're, as we take the Lord's Supper, we're going to give God thanks like he deserves. Let me invite you to stand with me. As we're standing, as we're bowing in prayer, this is a moment we come to with an attitude of thankfulness. That we thank the Lord that he is righteous, he is sovereign, he is true. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, while you may have some things to be thankful for, you may not be fully aware that your whole life is indebted to him. That not only is your life now dependent upon him, but any hope of the forgiveness of your sin any hope that you, would be, that you would have a relationship with God that God created you to have with him that only comes through Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you may be thankful for some things, but you, you can't be thankful for the ultimate things, the lasting things, the joyful things, the, the true things. That there is eternal life in Jesus. And this morning, you need to hear that he died, that he lived perfectly. He died sacrificially on a cross for your sins. And he arose again from the grave to conquer sin and death. That if, if you will repent and believe in him, you can be forgiven. You can be free. You can be made alive. You can walk with God. You can live forever with him. So if you don't know Jesus this morning... What an opportunity to come and bow the knee and to, and to confess him and thank him. Recognizing that he is Lord. And if you're here this morning, you're saying, you know what, I, I am a believer in Jesus. That in this time of waiting, as we are looking forward to eternity, every passing day, let's choose to be thankful. That we've got every reason to be grateful daily so let's make a decision let's ask God to create within us an attitude of thankfulness that will change your life Father we come to you this morning God in these next few minutes as we sing before we take the Lord's Supper in these next few moments as we sing this invitation God, right now, you are arms extended, arms wide open. You are inviting us to come to you and to recognize that you are the source of everything that is good in our lives. God, we ought to humble ourselves and be thankful. So, Lord, if somebody here this morning doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, God, would today be the day they make a decision and they say, you know what? I know that my sin is killing me, literally and spiritually, and that I want to be alive. I want to be forgiven. I want to be set free. I want to walk with God. If that's your heart this morning, would you come to Him? Lord, would you please draw them? Lord, for those of us who know you, God, 
cre- give us a, create within us a heart of thankfulness. God, may we be glad and, and, and joyful and may we give you honor and praise. God, may we, may we be may we be thankful. God, as we sing, may, may, we, may we respond to you as you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we pray, I'll have our guys come forward as we 
get ready to, to, to distribute the Lord's Supper. A couple of things just real quickly before we pray. Is that as, as you, when you receive the cup and the wafer, they'll both be connected. Uh, they'll be in one single container. So I would invite you as, as we go through it, you'll, you'll tear the top piece off, take out the wafer, and then you open up the bigger uh, flap and, and drink the juice. Um, as we do it, just as, as a word of instruction, but also as we pray, as we come into a time of taking the Lord's Supper, I, I, I have to, I have to encourage you and even at, at some level warn you that the Bible says that the that the that the, that the Lord's Supper is to be taken by believers after we've examined our hearts. So that's what this prayer is going to be here in just a moment. That Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians to examine our hearts so we don't, so we don't take the, the Lord's Supper in vain and really bring judgment, bring consequence on ourselves. That we don't want to come to the Lord with unconfessed sin. But as believers, we want to confess that sin right now in these next few moments as I pray before we take the Lord's Supper together. So guys, if you will come. And let's pray together. Father, God, we thank you that it is well with our souls because of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. Lord, that we have, that we have every reason to sing your praises and to thank you for all of eternity, for undeserved grace, undeserved mercy. God, and in, in this moment as we come to the, to the Lord's Supper, as we come to the table together as a church, God, we confess any sin that we, that, that, that we have been hiding or that has been unconfessed. God, you know what's in, what's in each and every one of our hearts and lives. God, you know our motivations. You know our struggles. God, and right now in these, in these moments, Lord, we come to you with an honest transparency and we say, Lord, here's who we are. We are a ragtag group, but Lord, you have redeemed us. So God, we pray that as we take of the cup and of the bread, God, that we would be reminded once again why we're thankful. Why that every day of our lives we ought to be thankful. So God, in these next few moments, as we take the Lord's Supper, would you, would you bless this time? In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.